Hello, today we'll continue with our series of lectures on behavioral science. Uh, the topic we're going to cover today is aggression. It's very important to get to know this topic, uh, especially when we make a relationship or a connection with some of the disorders that we'll cover later on uh, that are uh, categorized in the DSM-5. Uh, we should uh, be especially concerned with the conduct disorder and the antisocial personality disorder that uh, um, one of those one of the criteria for diagnosis has a lot to do with uh, one of the criterions for diagnosis for those disorders uh, have has a lot to do with aggression so it's important for uh, physicians and for any student of uh, psychology to understand the basis of aggression why do people turn violent and what can be done about it. And uh, US doctors in your rotations, well, sooner or later, unfortunately, will encounter cases of uh, victims of aggression. So it is important for you to know how to proceed and what is the both the ethical and the legal and also the medical procedures uh, when you face uh, intense cases of aggression uh, with any of your patients. So we'll also pay some attention to rape and what to do in those cases and why does rape happen. Um, remember that all of these topics will be covered in the USMLE, so at the end of this lecture we'll uh, do some uh, review questions uh, with the ones that resemble the ones that appear in the USMLE exam. So let's begin. Well, when we talk about aggression, aggression is pretty much a synonym of violence. So it's uh, important for us to understand what are some of the causes of uh, aggression and violence. And we'll get shortly to the psychological and the biological causes of uh, violence, uh, which for you physicians is very important to know. Uh, but we should also consider the social causes of violence. Uh, I wouldn't say that there is one single cause of violence uh, or aggression. Uh, and there has been a lot of debate about what exactly causes aggression and violence. Uh, but we shouldn't leave aside the social causes. So it's probably a mix of many factors, both uh, psychological and sociological. And of course, the psychological is the biological. So within the psychological causes of aggression, there are also biological causes of aggression. But before we get to that, let's consider first the social causes. And first of all, uh, aggression is related to poverty. Uh, those countries, not necessarily the poorest countries, are uh, the most violent. Uh, the United States is far from being one of the poorest countries in the world. In fact, it is one of the richest. Uh, but it is nevertheless true that it is uh, quite uh, violent, at least compared to other countries that are as prosperous as the United States. So, but having said that, we can still make a strong correlation between poverty and uh, aggression. And even in, in if, for instance, even inside the United States, those areas that are poorer tend to encounter uh, higher rates of aggression. So, for instance, African-American communities, well, it's a very unfortunate fact that, yes, they are very poor. And it's also, well, not extremely poor, but they're among the poorer communities in the United States. And it's also unfortunately true that uh, African-American communities are at higher risk of violence. So, as I was telling you in a previous lecture, uh, we can complain about all racism, and it's a very legitimate concern, but it's nevertheless true that a black man is more at risk of being killed by another black man than by a white police cop. Um, and this may have to do with poverty. I mean, uh, when people are poor, well, they, they have less access to education, they are under greater stress, uh, they may not be able to cover all their material needs, and all of that uh, increases the chances of uh, that the, the community may turn violent and the people may turn violent. Okay, having guns in a society also seems to have some relationship to aggression. Now, this is a very politicized topic in the United States, as I'm aware. Uh, the National Rifle Association will probably beg to differ on this one, what I'm saying. But I think the statistics are, are, are out there uh, that show that those countries that have uh, tougher gun controls uh, usually uh, have uh, better numbers when it comes to violence. Uh, I think this is common sense. I mean, if a government uh, tries to control weapons, then there, are, uh, the, the, there is not as great as an opportunity to kill other people. Now, that doesn't mean 
that uh, there aren't any other ways of uh, killing people, of course. I mean, if you take a look at the Rwandan genocide, uh, that uh, monstrosity was not carried out uh, with machine guns, but rather with machetes, and machetes are not outlawed in, in, in the United States or in any other country. And I think the people that uh, oppose gun control, they may also have some arguments uh, when they say that really those laws apply to the common citizens, but criminals will always find a way to have laws, to have guns. So uh, if criminals uh, sooner or later will have guns, then we might as well allow everybody to have guns in order for the common citizen to be uh, better defended against crime. And that may be an argument, but I think that overall, uh, and the argument, the, the evidence seems to point the other way, that the, the more a society controls weapons, uh, the more, uh, the, the less violence there is. Another important factor uh, is inequality. So it's not so much poverty, uh, but uh, how unequal societies are. And it is, this is undeniably true that uh, those societies are extremely unequal tend to have uh, more violence. So I can speak, for instance, for Latin America. Uh, Latin America may not be as poor as some African countries, uh, but it is hugely unequal. And in Latin America, the greater, the, the more unequal a country is, the, the higher the violence rate. And uh, there was a famous philosopher in the 19th century. His name was Karl Marx. You've probably heard of him. And Marx, uh, amongst many other things, uh, he put forth this argument. And he was basically saying that, well, when societies are very unequal, there is a tendency to, for people to clash uh, amongst themselves. And, you know, there are many psychological reasons for this. There is envy, there is resentment, uh, there is a sense of injustice. And when people feel that they're being, uh, that they're not, the, that society is not being fair to them, that they are not getting the piece of the pie that they deserve, they will usually... Uh, uh, get weapons and try to change things uh, via violence. Via violence, so uh, inequality is another uh, important social cause of of, of violence. Uh, broken families. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, broken families are responsible for a lot of bad things in society, and violence is one of them. So I mean, uh, you need par good parenting in order to educate children about uh, how to control violence, how to, uh, how to behave properly, how not to participate in aggression towards others. Uh, but of course, if uh, there are no parents around or if uh, the parents don't, care, don't pay attention to the children or if uh, there are single parents and so on, then it's much more difficult to perform that education labor uh, in the home. And of course, uh, that lack of education uh, at the family level uh, increases the chances that uh, people will eventually become uh, uh, violent. However, despite all these social causes, it is nevertheless true, and this has uh, uh, upset some people, but it's nevertheless true that historically violence has decreased. And uh, a very famous psychologist, uh, a Harvard psychologist, Steven Pinker, has defended uh, this for many years. He argues that uh, I mean, we may complain about all violence all we want, and sure, uh, there are the Columbine shootings and all of that, and 9-11, and uh, the war in Syria, and uh, the war in Afghanistan, and so on, and now threats against North Korea. But it is nevertheless true that over the last two or three centuries, violence has decreased significantly. So you can see a graph there of, uh, for instance, uh, how uh, homicide rates, at least in Europe, has declined over the last 600 years. And of course, these are homicide rates per 100,000 people. Uh, Steven Pinker has been in many debates about this. And he argues that uh, for a specific number of reasons, um, violence uh, has been decreasing. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, uh, literacy rates. I mean, the more education there is, the less violent uh, there is and other humane uh, advances in, in the history of uh, Western society. So, I mean, we may be all alarmed by uh, cases of violence, but we must nevertheless admit that uh, uh, we have made some uh, significant improvement. Here is a world map of homicide rate by country, so you can see uh, what the most violent countries in the world are and unfortunately Latin America gets the first place and some countries in sub-Saharan Africa. 
And of course, there is a correspondence uh, between, uh, first of all, uh, inequality, as I was saying, Latin America, probably the most violent of all regions. Uh, Latin America is mm, probably one of the most unequal uh, regions of the world. I mean, if you go to any Latin American country, uh, you can see some great mansions living side to side to some uh, uh, very... Uh, to some slums, and uh, it's qu it's quite interesting that is you see here the map in Latin America, you see countries such as Mexico, Venezuela, Brazil, Colombia, but if you see Cuba, Cuba doesn't have the same level of a homicide rate as the rest of Latin America. Now we may criticize Cuba all we want, and I'm one of the first to criticize Cuba, but it's nevertheless true that in Cuba there is higher equality than in the rest of Latin America because of course it's a communist country, uh, so that seems to drive. Uh, uh, homicide rates down. Uh, inequality is a big predictor of violence. Uh, and the same goes, well, but it's not the only predictor, of course. I mean, it's also, uh, if you take a look at Europe, uh, those countries that have a tougher uh, gun laws, such as Spain, Italy, or Germany, uh, those are the countries that have a lower uh, homicide rate. So it's a complicated uh, issue. And the sociological variables for uh, the sociological causes of violence are, are, are quite uh, varied. And we're still not sure which one is the most uh, important. But uh, all those factors must be taken in. For many years, there has always been concern also about whether or not the violence in media uh, really cause aggression. Uh, and there is a debate in the United States about this, and U.S. physicians uh, should be concerned about this because maybe you will encounter some uh, patients that have some level of violence, and uh, you may wonder whether or not if they watch too much uh, violent television or if they play violent video games, if that has anything to do with their uh, aggressive behavior. Uh, well, uh, there are... The, the, the jury is still out. I mean, some people claim that violence in media may actually be cathartic. Um, and catharsis is when you display some of your energy or your aggressive energy towards other things uh, that will not necessarily suffer. Uh, so, for instance, if you are upset uh, with uh, your friends and, you know, you're, you're, you have a drive to be violent against them, uh, well, you may suspend the violence against your friends if instead, let's say, that you hit the wall or that you hit something else and that's not actually a person. Well, that's catharsis because you're driving the negative uh, energy or the negative violence towards something uh, that is uh, not as problematic. And there are some people who claim that playing video games or watching uh, violent movies uh, may actually be catharsic. I mean, people have inner violence and they need something where they can discharge that violence. And uh, violence in the media, in this case, may actually be cathartic. Now, this is not a favor hypothesis against a psychologist, uh, because uh, there have been some experimental studies that have found correlations between the viewing of violence and increased interpersonal aggression. Now, some people might say, well, look, but I mean, if, if we go by that argument, then we should never read Shakespeare, because in Shakespeare, a lot of people die. And that may be true, <laughs> uh, but, you know, we should still keep in mind that in Shakespeare's days, uh, violence uh, was uh, much more common than today, very much as the graph that I previously showed you, that how in the 1600s, uh, the homicide rate was much higher than it is today. But at any rate, uh, reading Shakespeare is different from playing murder uh, simulators in video games. So, as I was saying, you know, the, the jury is still out. And the fact is that not all psychologists are convinced about whether or not the violence in media really cause aggression. So it's still a topic up for debate. Uh, there was a famous experiment in psychology about uh, whether or not uh, uh, violence in media do cause uh, uh, people to be more aggressive. And if you remember from the lecture on behaviorist uh, theory and learning theory, uh, we talked about uh, role modeling uh, as one of the techniques for behavioral change. So when children, I mean, it's not only conditioning how you can change someone's behavior, it could also be through modeling. If people watch uh, uh, the way other people behave, they could imitate that behavior. So the psychologist who came up with this idea, uh, Albert Bandura, who was very much uh, related to the, to the school of behaviorism, uh, Bandura designed an experiment to test whether or not uh, 
children who watch violent behavior eventually become violent themselves. So in that experiment, a group of boys watched some adult uh, punch a bubble doll. And another group uh, watched uh, the doll without being punched. Now the results came out and the first group, that is to say the group of boys who did watch uh, an adult uh, punch the bubble doll, that first group exhibited more aggressiveness towards the doll than uh, the other group. So that has been taken as evidence that, well, yes, uh, violent video games and violence in the media does affect, uh, does have some influence on, on aggression. But that experiment has been criticized for many reasons. I mean, maybe children are, understand that it's just a bubble doll, and if they watch adults hit someone else, a real person, then maybe they will not uh, follow that behavior. Uh, or maybe uh, the children uh, are just... Uh, punching the bubble doll because, uh, well, the experimenters uh, in, in some way uh, induced them to do it. Uh, so, you know, there were some flaws in this experiment and although it has been very famous, uh, it has not been a conclusive experiment. So I think the jury is still out on whether or not uh, violence in the media really does cause uh, uh, violence in the real world. And uh, there are some people who argue in favor of, of it and there are some people who argue against it. Uh, I can tell you that Steven Pinker, the psychologist that I've been telling you about, he decidedly thinks that violence in the media is not a factor uh, to explain violence in the real world. Let's consider the biological basis of aggression and how biology and aggression relate to each other. Well, first of all, in human behavior, there is an association between sexuality and aggression. And to a certain extent, the biological features that control sexual behavior may also have an influence on how aggressive people are. So, uh, <clears throat> um, both uh, sexuality and aggression have some relation to the hormonal system. Uh, and uh, we can expect to see some correspondence between hormones and, and aggression. So males uh, tend to be more aggressive than females. Uh, this is not a, a stereotype. I mean, uh, this is hard uh, biological data. Uh, as I was telling you, our hormones do play a role, so androgens uh, have something to do uh, with, uh, with uh, violence. Uh, uh, androgenic or anabolic steroids, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, they are chemically uh, related to hormones and so on. Uh, uh, they are the ones that are used by bodybuilders, and this may eventually uh, cause increased uh, uh, aggression. So people who use steroids are at a higher risk of being more aggressive. Although, of course, there are many media myths about uh, how aggressive bodybuilders may come after they take steroids. There is what's called roid rage or steroid rage, and allegedly that's uh, when bodybuilders are just uh, become uh, violently out of control uh, because of the action of the of the steroids. Uh, but yeah, that's a that's a myth. I mean. Uh, has not been really documented to that level. But it's nevertheless true that um, uh, androgenic or anabolic steroids uh, do play a role in, in aggression. Uh, and, and that in, in that sense, uh, uh, hormones uh, have to do something with this. Uh, estrogens, progesterone, and antiandrogens, which are blockers of androgen receptors, on the other hand, decrease aggression and may be useful for treating sex offenders. So, yes, I mean, there are hormones that increase uh, aggression and there are some other hormones that uh, decrease aggression or that are uh, other substances that work as uh, blockers of androgen receptors. So, uh, you must remember that the psychological is the biological. So, uh, and the psychological reasons for aggression may themselves be biological reasons. Aggression may also be related to substance abuse, and this is where you physicians come in and uh, you should try to figure out when you have a patient uh, that's extremely violent, whether or not they're on, to, they're on something. Uh, when we get to substance abuse, we'll cover in a little bit greater detail what the intoxication symptoms for each uh, drug is. Uh, but for the time being, uh, let's uh, keep in mind a few uh, uh, the, the way some of these drugs work and how they influence on, uh, on aggressive behavior. So low doses of alcohol decrease aggression. <laughs> you 
are probably quite aware of this. I mean, we've all probably had uh, some low doses of alcohol, and when people have low doses, when people begin drinking, well, they become more inhibited. Uh, I'm sorry, they, they become less inhibited, so they are more friendly, more outgoing, and in low doses, it decreases uh, aggression, so people uh, get along. But high doses, I mean, if you eventually get drunk, that increases aggression. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you as doctors, uh, when you uh, have to deal with people that are drunk, uh, that are uh, intoxicated with alcohol, uh, you should expect some aggression from the patients. Uh, opioids or heroin users uh, are not usually aggressive. Uh, because, of course, opioids are not really stimulants. I mean, you can expect more aggression in drugs that are more stimulants and that the, it affects uh, the neurochemistry with uh, stimulant uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, so increased aggression is more associated with the use of stimulants, uh, basically cocaine and amphetamines. So that's something to watch for. And of course, it's not only hormones that have to do with aggression, uh, neurotransmitters also have to do with aggression. So, uh, there are some neurotransmitters that inhibit aggression. Uh, first of all, there is serotonin and uh, GABA. Um, uh, those are neurotransmitters that uh, are usually, uh, they usually inhibit aggression. That is to say, they do not uh, promote aggression. So, uh, recommended drugs for aggression treatments, well, they're the antidepressants. Those are the ones that usually uh, increase uh, serotonin levels, uh, benzodiazepines, antipsychotics, and antimaniacs. Uh, and th all those drugs uh, may have the effect of decreasing aggression. And of course, uh, for instance, antipsychotics that are used for patients with schizophrenia. schizophrenia. Schizophrenic patients are not necessarily violent, but uh, they may be uh, if they're too disturbed. So antipsychotic uh, medication uh, may eventually inhibit some of their aggressions. Now, neurotransmitters are not the only way that the brain uh, uh, influences uh, aggression. There may also be head injuries, especially brain uh, injuries in the temporal lobe, in the frontal lobes, and the hypothalamus. Uh, all of those areas, when they're injured, they are associated with uh, aggression. Uh, and there is a very famous case in the history of neuroscience that uh, is usually addressed to explain the influence of uh, brain injury with uh, aggression. Uh, in the 19th century, this is the case of uh, Phineas Gage. Now, Phineas Gage was a 19th century railroad worker in the United States, in America. And by all accounts, he was known as a very nice guy. Uh, he was very kind, uh, he got along with other people, his friends were very nice to him, and he was very nice to his friends. Uh, however, he suffered an accident. An iron rod uh, traversed his frontal left lobe, uh, kind of as you see in the image. Uh, so it, it was quite a serious injury. Uh, now, astonishingly, uh, Phineas Gage, even though a, an iron rod uh, traversed his whole brain, um, uh, he did not die uh, because brain injuries may be fatal but not necessarily so. I mean there are, have been many cases of uh, uh, some external agent uh, uh, touching the brain and you know that may have some changes in behavior but they're not necessarily fatal. Now it, it was definitely the case that after Phineas Gage uh, had this injury uh, Eventually, he had a, he went through a sudden transformation. So, from being a very nice guy, uh, and from being a something that was a, that got along with someone that got along with other people, uh, and that he was not aggressive at all, he became an unreliable and very aggressive man. I mean, he used to have uh, social inhibitions, and after this accident, uh, well, he became disinhibited, uh, and he eventually became much more violent. Uh, now, the case of we're not exactly sure what happened with the case of Phineas Gage, but uh, ever since neuroscientists have used his case as a hint that uh, most definitely uh, brain injuries can definitely affect uh, uh, the way people behave, especially when it comes to aggression.
So apart from uh, neurotransmitters and head injuries, uh, genetics uh, also plays a significant role when it comes to aggression. Uh, we're not really sh we're not really sure uh, on what specific genes cause aggression. I mean, uh, we still haven't uh, isolated a particular gene that causes someone to be a killer or something, anything like that. But there have been some hints. For some years, uh, there was a hypothesis that people with an additional Y chromosome uh, may have been at an increased risk of being violent. So. Um, uh, the XYY chromosome, um, uh, it, it, that's found in only 0,1% of the general population. But it's found in 3.5% of prison population. So there were some uh, geneticists and biologists who argued that this uh, additional Y chromosome, that by the way, doesn't really have any other... Uh, and any other effects on people. I mean, people with a XYY chromosome are normal. Um, they have a normal uh, behavior and, and, and physiological features. Uh, but uh, for some time, there was a suspicion that this may have, have had something to do with aggression because of that disparity. And it certainly is a considerable disparity going from 0 0.1 to 3.5. But even if uh, the difference between 0 0.1 and 3.5 is great, uh, the people who criticize the, these, uh, these uh, allegations uh, claim that, look, uh, there may be a disparity between those two numbers, but they're still very low numbers. Uh, I mean, if it were, let's say, 20% in the general population and 80% in the prison population, okay, a case could be made. But just because it's 0.1% in the general population and 3.5% in the prison population, 35 is still a very low number. Uh, so, you know, the consensus is that there is no conclusive evidence uh, from uh, this uh, finding of the XYY chromosome being uh, more common in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the prison population. But it's still, uh, the, the jury is still out. I mean, there are some geneticists who still uh, consider this hypothesis. And for the time being, it's not going anywhere. I mean, it's still out there for people to discuss it. Now, apart from these uh, XYY chromosome uh, findings, uh, it is nevertheless true that uh, there are greater uh, concordance when it comes to aggression uh, in monozygotic twins, that is to say, twins that have uh, identical uh, genetic, uh, the genetic makeup, then in uh, dizygotic twins or fraternal twins, and those are twins that are not uh, genetically identical. So uh, uh, the chance of uh, two monozygotic twins uh, being both uh, uh, aggressive people is far higher than the chance of two uh, dizygotic twins uh, being both aggressive. So uh, that's, um, that's uh, one, another hint that maybe aggression is actually in the genes. Evolutionary psychologists, uh, or some of them, not all of them, but some of them, have uh, uh, theorized uh, that uh, it's quite likely that we have killer genes. And there is a killer ape theory uh, put forth by a famous uh, evolutionary psychologist, uh, Robert Audrey. And basically what this theory claims is that being aggressive uh, was a, a natural advantage uh, in our evolution as a, as a human, uh, in the evolution of the human species. Because, I mean, uh, if you were a killer and you killed your competitors, then you had greater chance of uh, spreading your genes uh, more. So the ones who survived uh, were the ones who were more violent. Now, of course, this has a con this has a counter argument, and that's uh, the both the group selection uh, theory and the uh, altruism theory, which claims, well, yeah, I mean, being a killer may have helped you uh, spread your genes more, but on the other hand. You also needed to cooperate uh, with other people in order to make sure that you survive and that you, you that your genes uh, were spread out. So uh, the jury is still out here. Also, uh, evolutionary psychologists are not all that clear whether or not uh, we have uh, genes uh, to be uh, to to for to be killers. Uh, so we're not so uh, the killer ape theory has not been uh, defended by all evolutionary psychologists. But there is one important factor, and this is uh, widely accepted by evolutionary psychologists, and that is uh, Hamilton's rule or uh, kin selection. We talked about this in a previous uh, 
lecture. There is a tendency for, uh, not only for human beings, but for um, all animals, to have a, to behave more altruistically towards uh, those uh, other animals with whom we share a higher proportion of genes, that is to say relatives. So the closer genetically you are to someone else, uh, the less likely you are to be aggressive to, towards that person. And uh, the more uh, uh, distant uh, someone is genetically to you, then uh, the more likely you are to behave more aggressively towards that person. So there is a higher incidence of aggression towards uh, non-kin. Uh, remember when we talked about uh, the Cinderella effect, we, talked, uh, we mentioned that it was uh, children that are adopted are at higher risk of child abuse than children that are not adopted, that they have their, their raised by their biological parents. And um, this is something to be kept in mind by physicians uh, when, when dealing with aggression. Okay, so let's delve in now into some matters that have to do with aggression and that especially concern you physicians, and that is the abuse and neglect of children and the elderly. Uh, you have to, when you do your rotations and you're in emergency rooms and, uh, and also when, when people visit your, your, your offices, uh, you should always watch out for abuse-related injuries and how to differentiate them from non-abuse injuries. Because remember uh, that, uh, at least in the case of children, you have the ethical obligation to report uh, uh, injuries uh, if they come from abuse. So you should, uh, uh, you should be aware of which injuries are more likely related to abuse and which injuries are more accidental. So, at least in the case of children, non-abuse uh, injuries uh, uh, may be bruises and scrapes on the chin, uh, on the forehead, on the knees, and on the, on the elbows. I mean, those are relatively common. Children may be playing in the playground and they may fall and they may usually get those bruises. You know, uh, if you see those bruises in children, you shouldn't really uh, suspect uh, that they are uh, being abused. Now, nevertheless, there may be some injuries that are non-accidental, but they may not necessarily be abuse injuries. And those are some cultural practices uh, that include uh, uh, doing some injuries on the child in order so that the child will get better. Now, uh, if you don't have enough cultural sensitivity, uh, and remember we talked about this in, in, in the lecture on the doctor-patient relationship and in the lecture on uh, cultural differences, between different ethnic groups. If you don't have cultural insensitivity, you may come to think that that child is being abused, uh, but uh, not necessarily. I mean, maybe some children uh, have some bruises that are do not come from accidents, but they may come from alternative therapies that may look like injuries to you, and in fact, they, are, they actually are, but uh, the parents do not really intend to harm the child. Now, in those cases, uh, there's some debate about whether or not you should report it, but given the need of the doctors to have some cultural sensitivity, the consensus is that uh, you shouldn't report that as uh, children abuse uh, or neglect. So, for instance, there is the issue of cupping. In Chinese uh, culture, uh, there is a, 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 an alternative medicine treatment that consists in uh, putting some hot objects on uh, children's uh, back, and, and also, this also works in adults, uh, because allegedly that, you know, according to Chinese traditional medicine, that uh, drains energy better, so there is better energy flow. Now, that leaves some mild injuries on their back. If you see that, uh, you may uh, think that the child is being abused, but again, you should be uh, culturally sensitive in order to understand that this is a cultural practice, and that even though uh, the child may have been injured and it may not have been an accident, uh, it's not properly child abuse. And in fact, there is a movie uh, that I recommend to you. It's called The Washa Treatment. And it's about a Chinese family living in America that performs uh, some uh, uh, traditionally uh, some, um, some uh, treatment on, on their children that comes from uh, traditional uh, Chinese uh, medicine. It's not properly copying, but it's actually putting some scars on the child's back. And because they live in New York, uh, they are uh, the, the, the child protective services have to report that, and you know the parents. Uh, uh, I don't remember if they go to prison, but the, the child's custody is taken away from them. 
Um, and of course, uh, this presents an ethical dilemma about cultural relativism, about whether or not uh, you know doctors should be culturally sensitive. And the message of the movie is that doc doctors should indeed be should indeed be culturally sensitive, and that they should understand uh, how other uh, co cultures uh, cope uh, with diseases. So, if you see some injuries on the child's back, that's not necessarily um, uh, that's not necessarily uh, child abuse or neglect. And here is a famous image of a very famous guy <laughs> uh, having the cupping technique applied to him. Now, uh, most doctors will agree that uh, cupping uh, didn't really have a great effect on Michael Phelps swimming and that it was actually a loss of time. But uh, that's not the point. The point is that U.S. doctors have to understand the, the patient's uh, culture and uh, you shouldn't report as a child abuse something that's clearly uh, not intended to be as child abuse. Okay, so let's talk uh, um, some more about what child abuse is and how you can de detect it. So, so far we have covered uh, injuries that are not considered child abuse. Uh, those are accidental injuries. Uh, let's talk now about some injuries that U.S. doctors will probably uh, see and that uh, you should uh, report them as uh, child abuse. Uh, well, in the case of child abuse, the most likely abuser uh, are probably, uh, are usually the closest family members. So for instance, the mother. I mean, it's not very likely that someone totally unrelated to the child will abuse the child. When you see cases of child abuse, most likely it is uh, someone who's uh, related to the child. And unfortunately, uh, most cases it's, most of the time is step parents or stepfathers usually and that's probably i mean whenever there are cases of child abuse uh, the police and physicians uh, their first suspicion is usually on the stepfather and this may go back again to the cinderella effect that i was mentioning i mean uh, for some evolutionary reasons uh, their uh, pa step parents uh, may have a uh, uh, good reasons to, uh, from an evolutionary, evolutionary point of view, they may have good reasons to uh, abuse their child uh, because, well, they may want to apart them from their real biological children so they can spread their genes better. So this is what the Cinderella effect is. And uh, it's, uh, doctors should be on the watch, especially in relationships between uh, children and uh, stepfathers, which is a relationship that is at a higher risk of uh, child abuse. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, stepfathers uh, are uh, inherently violent, but uh, it's something that uh, you should be on watch in case of, of a suspicion of child abuse. Uh, now, how do you know whether or not a child uh, is abused? Well, there are some behavioral characteristics of abused children. So, first of all, hyperactivity, uh, mild retardation, uh, those are characteristics of the abuse. But you should also watch for characteristics of the abuser. Uh, substance abuse, poverty, social isolation, and having been abused. And this is very unfortunate. I mean, there are uh, high rates of uh, repeating behavior here. If you have been abused during your childhood, then that increases the risk of you abusing other children uh, when you grow up. Now, some of the signs of child abuse uh, well, first of all, neglect. So a kid who uh, is not properly groomed, who has, doesn't have who doesn't have good hygiene, and who is undernourished, who has some nutrition problems, uh, that may be a sign of child abuse. Uh, bruises. Now remember, you have to differentiate abuse bruises from non-abuse bruises. So if you see bruises on the knees or the elbows, well, that's most likely because the child uh, fell. Uh, but there are some other bruises uh, that are definitely not signs of that are definitely signs of child abuse. Uh, for instance, uh, bruises on the buttocks, so that's when probably uh, parents have spanked the child, uh, or the lower back. That's usually another area of the body where uh, uh, adults uh, usually hit their uh, children for child abuse. So you know, if you see those uh, signs, you you should suspect that maybe child abuse is going on. And also uh, fractures, uh, spiral fractures due to limb twisting. Uh, this is very common. I mean, there is a very nasty habit of some parents of, of twisting the kids' arms in order to uh, make them comply. Now, because uh, bone development is not uh, uh, fully achieved during childhood, there is a greater risk of spiral fractures. So if you see spiral fractures 
in children, it, uh, it's quite likely that this has been due to limb twisting and this is a sign uh, of child abuse. Um, another sign is for cigarette burns, uh, uh, ankle rope burns. Uh, you, you should suspect that this is child abuse because there are some habits of uh, parents of uh, tying a child uh, either to a specific place or uh, and they do this by tying uh, by using a rope and tying uh, and tying their ankles so they won't move so uh, if you if, if the parent I mean that's an abuse in itself but it's even more of an abuse if they tie the rope uh, too tightly and that causes some born some burns in their ankles and also uh, another sign that you should watch for is uh, burns due to hot water. So this is another common way of uh, abusing parents to punish their children. Um, they uh, either throw hot water at them or they immerse them in hot water so that they uh, allegedly they may be more calm and that their behavior, they settle down. But of course this is a severe sign of child abuse. And there is also what's called a shaking baby syndrome. Uh, some parents who become impatient with children and become desperate uh, because the child, the child is crying too much, uh, as a last resort, they may try to shake the baby so that the baby stops crying. Now, this is very dangerous because there can be retinal detachment or hemorrhage. Uh, and there can also be a subdural hematoma. So. Uh, the shaking baby syndrome uh, is more common than people think because, I mean, parents who are not necessarily abusing, uh, but in a moment of desperation because the child is crying too much, they may shake the child, uh, that may cause some significant damage. And that counts as a child abuse, so that's something uh, that you should watch for. Okay, so children are not the only ones that are subject to abuse. Uh, there's also, uh, you physicians should also have a suspicion of uh, elder abuse because that's also quite frequent. So, uh, very much as in the case of uh, child abuse, in the case of uh, elder abuse, the most likely abuser is the closest family member with whom the person lives. And it's usually the one uh, who has some economic dependency on the, uh, on the victim. So, uh, in the case of elderly people, um, well, elderly people usually have the means uh, to provide for some caregiver and uh, if that caregiver becomes frustrated, although he may be economically dependent on the victim, uh, the abuser may still nevertheless uh, abuse uh, the other person. So um, that's the profile you should always uh, watch, uh, be, 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 be watchful of that situation. The characteristic of the victims or of the abuse, uh, well, first of all, uh, there is worsening cognitive impairment. Uh, so, uh, if you see a cognitive deterioration in an elderly person, I mean, that's not necessarily due to abuse. There are some cognition, there are some conditions, of course, that uh, include a sentence cognitive uh, uh, impairment, impairment, but uh, it should still be in your mind, you know, whether or not uh, perhaps this could be a hint of, uh, of abuse. And also increased physical dependence on others. Uh, this is another characteristic of uh, the abuse elderly. Uh, characteristics of the abuser: well, uh, substance abuse. Uh, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol will always uh, get people to do bad things. So uh, if you see that, it, I mean, this is really a combination of hints. If you just see one elderly person with worsening cognitive impairment, that's not enough to suspect uh, elderly abuse. But if you see that this person has a caregiver who comes drunk to, to the doctor's appointment, or seems to be poor, or seems to be economically dependent on the elder person, and also they seem to be socially isolated, well, in that case, then you may begin to suspect that there may be elder abuse going on. Because, as I was saying, those are the other characteristics of the abuser. Substance abuse, uh, poverty, and social isolation. Now, the signs of elder abuse, uh, properly speaking, well, very much as in the, style of, uh, as in the signs of uh, child abuse, there is poor hygiene, uh, lack of medication, and nutrition. Uh, bruises may also be a sign of elder abuse. Um, they are a little bit different from the ones uh, that you should uh, use in order to suspect uh, child abuse because in the case of elderly people, the bruises that are more related to abuse 
or bruises on, on the arms from being grabbed uh, by the abusers. Uh, but very much as in the case of uh, children, uh, if you watch, if you see spiral fractures due to limb twisting, uh, that's another uh, sign of uh, child abuse. I mean, it's not natural for elderly people to twist the, their own limbs. I mean, if, if, they're, if they break, uh, if they have spiral fractures uh, due to limb twisting, it's because someone else has twisted their, 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 their limbs. And, uh, and, and very much uh, in the same manner that uh, during childhood, uh, bone development is not fully achieved, so there are the higher risks of fracture. Well, the same goes for older age. I mean, uh, bones become weaker as you go, uh, as you age. Uh, after, some after some time in the development of life, and so older people are at increased risk of fractures. And if you see limb twisting, uh, spiral fractures due to limb twisting, then that's definitely a sign of abuse. And very much as in child abuse, also cigarette burns and ankle rope burns uh, are also signs of, of abuse. Other signs, uh, well, internal abdominal injuries. Uh, maybe if you see that, there is reason to suspect that they may have been hit uh, around the abdominal area and they, they have now internal abdominal injuries. Uh, and also depleted personal finances. I mean, if you are aware that someone has money, but all of a sudden they turn out uh, that they do not have money and they pay, the person who takes care of that uh, person is drunk and so on, then you may suspect that the, the caregiver is uh, taking their money uh, in order for them to buy more drinks and so on. So instead of using the finances uh, to cover uh, the caregiving expenses and to provide food for the elderly, they are using it for their own. Uh, so that's something to watch for. And also uh, head injuries are also another sign of uh, elder abuse. Now all of this has sequels. So in the case of child abuse, uh, uh, children who have been abused may develop dissociative identity disorder. Uh, these are multiple personality disorders. Uh, they are a little bit controversial in the history of psychiatry, uh, but nevertheless, uh, they are real. And uh, those uh, patients that have developed this disorder usually have a history of child abuse. Uh, child abuse may also cause a post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, depression, and uh, substance abuse. And as I was saying, uh, if you were a victim of child abuse, then you are at a, an increased risk of being a child abuser your, yourself. There is a special type of child abuse, which is a sexual uh, child abuse. And how, how do you come to find out whether or not a child has been sexually abused? Well, at least uh, in order to at least grow a suspicion, uh, you may see some signs. So first of all, uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, there is no reason for children to have any of these diseases. Unless, of course, uh, they have received it from their parents, uh, for instance, uh, the HIV virus uh, because of the mother-child transmission. Uh, but apart from that, uh, if you see a child with any STDs, then there's suspicion that they're engaged in sexual activity. And of course, uh, sexual activity in children is uh, uh, abuse. I mean, even if <laughs> there is really no consent in this. Uh, if you see genital or anal trauma, that's another sign of child abuse. And also, and this is very important, if you see in, that the child has some knowledge of sexual activity. I mean, it is not for normal. It is not normal for children uh, to know details about uh, oral sex or anal sex or vaginal sex or anything else. Uh, so if you see that a child is uh, too interested in sexual activity, or has a, a, a significant knowledge of uh, sexual activity, uh, that may be a sign of sexual child abuse because that's not normal. Uh, and also, uh, excessive initiation of sexual activity with peers, uh, that may be another uh, sign of, uh, of, of, of child abuse, of sexual child abuse. Um, urinary infections may also be a sign of, child, of sexual child abuse, although not necessarily because there are other ways that a child could get urinary infections without necessarily engaging in uh, sexual activity. But, uh, as I was saying, this may be a hint. Uh, usually, uh, the most common age uh, for children to suffer child abuse is between 9 and 12 years old, and 25% of the victims are younger than 8 years old. Uh, 
when dealing with this, uh, very much as in the other types of abuse, you should always be on the watch for the characteristics of the abuser. So when it comes to sexual abusers, uh, most of them uh, know the child. They're either cousins or uncles or neighbors or friends or whatever. Uh, fewer than 5% are strangers. So uh, if you suspect child abuse, uh, well, one of the characteristics that you could be guided by is this. Uh, sexual child abusers are also, um, they, they also have a high incidence of alcohol and drug use and uh, they may also have a uh, marital problems so they have no alternative uh, sexual partner uh, and of course the hypothesis here is that the, that sexual energy is usually drained uh, towards children because you know they are they fail at finding other uh, sexual uh, partners uh, usually uh, they are non-violent uh, so sexual abusers do not usually, with children, do not usually employ violence as opposed to rapists uh, against uh, women. I mean, in the case of women, because women have a greater opportunity of defending themselves, violence has to be used. In the case of sexual child abuse, because uh, children uh, are more easily to handle um, and they comply easier with the commands of the adult, uh, um, uh, uh, child molesters are usually non-violent so don't be confused uh, if you suspect that someone uh, is a child abuser a sexual child abuser but you don't see that that person is uh, violent well that's uh, not a sign of not being a child abuser uh, I mean because child, sexual child abusers are usually uh, non-violent Okay, let's talk also about the physical and sexual abuse of domestic partners. Uh, as you probably know, male on female abuse is far more common than female on male abuse. Uh, there is an increased reluctance of abused women to report, and I think this is especially so in Latin America. I don't know how it works in the United States, but in Latin America, uh, the machismo region of the world, uh, there is an increased uh, reluctance of women to report and they may say oh but you know he hit me but uh, he loves me and you know I don't want to go and, 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 and make a file a report or press charges and there's also you know if there is a social expectation that the woman must uh, put up with this and that this may cause embarrassment to the woman then that's another social factor that uh, uh, increases the probability that the woman may be reluctant to report uh, a, a domestic violence. Uh, the physical evidence of uh, domestic violence, uh, in the case, especially in the cases of women, well, uh, bruises, uh, broken bones, black eyes, and uh, in the case of pregnant women, uh, a, a very clear uh, sign of physical abuse is uh, injuries in the baby zone. Um, so. Uh, uh, husbands that are violent and that uh, batter women, when the woman is pregnant, they do have a tendency to injure the woman in the baby's hand. And of course, this is extremely dangerous because it could cause uh, an abortion. Uh, usually, the cycle of, of abuse in domestic relationships is first of all, there is a building of tensions, then there is battering from the husband to the wife, and after the, the violent act, there are apologies and you know this is quite common I mean the husband uh, has fights and argues with the wife uh, the tension grows they hit the wife and after that uh, the husband begins to cry and he begins to ask for apologies and you know he's saying this won't happen again but of course uh, it will most likely happen again and this is why women should report it now remember uh, in the case of child of the children you are as physicians uh, require to report uh, these cases. In the case of women, only if the wife consents to reporting. I mean, you cannot do it for them because uh, the ethical principle of autonomy applies here and uh, women uh, have to decide on their own whether or not they report these cases. The characteristics of abusers when it comes to uh, domestic uh, violence, uh, well, very much as in the other cases, they're more likely to be drug and alcohol users uh, they are impulsive, uh, they tend to have a lot of frustration, they have a lack of control, and they have low self-esteem. And the characteristic of victims, of the battered wives, is uh, dependence on the abusers. Uh, this is very common. I mean, if, if a woman has economic dependence on the husband uh, and the husband hits her, 
well, she may have to figure out whether or not to report uh, the, what just happened because if she reports him and she takes him to the police, uh, the woman, the husband may uh, suspend the, uh, the payment to the wife and, you know, it may be very difficult for them to go on. So it's a very difficult situation. Uh, victims of domestic violence uh, also have a tendency to blame themselves and this is sort of a defense mechanism uh, and uh, this is the way uh, they try to rationalize it, uh, the fact that they are not going to uh, tell the authorities about abuse by saying, oh, it was all my fault. And of course, it wasn't their fault, but the fact that they're vulnerable in economic terms uh, may eventually lead them to uh, blame themselves so as to prevent them from uh, filing reports to the police. And it's also true that uh, victims of uh, domestic violence tend to have a uh, low self-esteem. Now, what should you as doctors do? Uh, well, there are some ethical obligations when it comes to uh, abuse. Uh, physicians must report suspected child abuse, even if it's only a suspicion. The, the authorities will eventually carry out an investigation and they will decide. So if it is just a suspicion, you are required to uh, report it and you don't have to tell the suspected abuser uh, so in the case of children uh, confidentiality here does uh, uh, well uh, you can take uh, make the decisions uh, uh, regardless of whether or not uh, the, the the suspected abuser uh, knows I mean you don't have to inform them and actually if you inform them uh, there is an increased risk that the abuser may uh, become an obstacle in future investigations so it's uh, better not to tell the suspected abuser and report the, uh, the, the abuse to the authorities. Uh, if an elderly abuse victim seems mentally impaired, then it must also be reported. Because remember, the case uh, of autonomy in ethical, in medical ethics applies to children and to people who are mentally impaired. So if an elderly abuse victim seems not to be mentally fit, and you suspect that that person has been abused, then it must also be reported. And you don't need a family consent for this. Now, in the case of adult victims who are not mentally impaired, then the autonomy principle applies to them. And it's up to the victim whether or not the abuse uh, will be reported. However, uh, the physician should encourage the abuse victims to report it. So the physician should consult, but nevertheless should never uh, cohere uh, the victim into reporting. And let's talk about uh, rape, uh, which is a very particular type of uh, sexual abuse. Well, rape is defined as sexual content uh, without consent. Uh, and you've seen all those slogans that say no means no. Well, that's what it actually means. I mean, if they say no, then it means no. And that's a lack of consent and sexual contact without uh, consent. It's considered to be rape. Uh, so uh, it could be vaginal penetration, uh, not necessarily by the penis. I mean, uh, having uh, intercourse is not the only way of raping someone. Uh, it could also be with the finger or with another object, uh, some sexual toy or whatever. Uh, erection and ejaculation are not necessary for rape. So maybe a woman could be forced to have sexual intercourse and uh, even if the rapist is, doesn't achieve an erection, if still uh, forces the woman to have contact uh, w of, from her genitals with his genital, uh, that's still considered rape. Uh, a special type of rape is called sodomy or uh, anal rape, and that's the insertion of penis or an object into the anus. Uh, let's take a look at some of the profiles of rapists and victims so that you can have uh, some hints about who's at risk here when, when you encounter these situations as uh, physicians. Uh, the rapist is usually younger than 25 and it's usually known to the victim. Uh, it's quite rare to find uh, rapists that are older than 25 and this may have to do with the fact that uh, rape, although it may be a, a an overt sign of aggression, it may also be a, a sexual uh, process. So people who have increased uh, sexual drive, well, they're obviously a, a have a greater chance of uh, being rapists. Uh, the victims uh, are they are usually between uh, 16 and 24 years of age. Uh, usually, rape happens inside the victim's home, 
and uh, women who have had children and have been raped, they may not necessarily have uh, vaginal injuries. Uh, now, rape has some very serious uh, sequels, uh, and it's important to know them. Uh, only 25% of uh, rape cases are reported. And um, in the case of rape, there may be uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. So there may be uh, some need for some psychiatric help. Uh, emotional recovery time for rape victims usually lasts uh, one year. And usually the line of treatment here is group therapy uh, with other rape victims because it's such a traumatic experience that support groups are highly encouraged. You as doctors should know that there are some legal issues that are important to take into account when it comes to rape. Uh, lack of semen is not proof of innocence as rapist uh, may have worn a, because the rapist may have worn a condom or he may have had difficulty with erection and ejaculation. But remember that uh, ejaculation and erection are not necessary in order to consider it a uh, rape. Uh, proof of resistance is not necessary for conviction either. And previous information about the victim, and this usually comes up in rape cases, uh, is usually irrelevant. So if a rape victim uh, used to be uh, very sexually promiscuous and she liked to flirt with other people, uh, well, that's usually not admitted in court. There is also marital rape, and you should be, you should understand this. Uh, just because uh, a couple is married, that doesn't mean that rape uh, does not, uh, cannot happen. Uh, a husband can rape a wife. Uh, so uh, in the 1970s, marital rape uh, was criminalized. So there is an understanding that even if you're married, uh, that you're not uh, required to have sex with your husband. Uh, and if your husband forces you to have uh, sex with him, then that's considered a marital rape. Um, unfortunately, in some countries, it's still not a crime, but the tendency is that uh, uh, it's becoming more of a crime in more countries. There is also date rape, and this is when you know uh, the girl accepts going on a date with, uh, with a guy, and there may be some mild sexual invitation, uh, but nevertheless, uh, the guy uh, forces the girl to have sex with him. Now, this is called date rape because, well, yeah, there may have been some steps uh, towards uh, having sex, but uh, the girl did not fully comply, and if she had sex uh, without uh, complying, uh, then that's still considered rape. And there is also statute, statutory rape, and that's when um, uh, people have sex and they're under the age of consent. Uh, so maybe they gave outwards appearance of having sex and maybe they even enjoyed <laughs> the sexual encounter but if they were below the age of uh, consent then that's still considered statutory rape even if uh, apparently there was no force involved um, the age of consent varies across countries in some countries it is 16 in other countries it is uh, it's between 16 and 18 it varies across uh, different countries um, but make no mistake about it, it's still considered rape. What should a physician do uh, if he encounters a case of rape? Uh, what should he do immediately? Well, first of all, be supportive and not to question the victim's testimony. Uh, there should be physical examination and there should be lab tests. There should be a screening of uh, sexually transmitted diseases. And also uh, there should be a screening for the presence, for the presence of semen uh, in, in the woman's body. Uh, there should be some antibiotics or prophylactic antibiotics, uh, uh, that is to say preventive antibiotics, should be given and in, because um, there is an increased risk that the rape uh, may have put the victim at risk of uh, infection. And uh, postcoital contraceptive measures should also uh, be given. So just in the case that the woman was pregnant or got pregnant as a result of, of the rape. Uh, six weeks after the rape, uh, the doctor should discuss with the patient uh, the emotional state and consider referring the victim uh, to uh, uh, support group therapy because you remember that this usually takes about a year to overcome emotionally and uh, so six weeks after the initial shock, uh, the doctor should uh, ask the patient well how she's doing emotionally and if he sees some signs of disturbance then maybe should consider her referring to group therapy and if it's you know if, if it's a little bit more severe then maybe to some uh, psychiatric uh, help 
and there should also be pregnancy test and because there is a danger that their patient may have been uh, pregnant as a result of the rape okay so let's do a couple of USMLE questions about uh, about this topic a 33 year old single woman who has a four-year-old child comes to the emergency room and reports that she was raped by a man she was on a date with uh, two days ago the physical examination shows no physical evidence of rape so no injuries or no semen uh, she appears anxious uh, and spacey uh, now it is most likely that this woman a is delusional b is a uh, malingering malingering is inventing uh, uh, physical symptoms that, that are not really there. Uh, C is suffering from uh, hypochondriasis. Uh, D is suffering from conversion disorder or E has been raped and the rapist used a condom. The most likely answer here is E. Remember that women who have already given birth, uh, if they're raped, uh, it may be that uh, there is no, uh, uh, that, that they may have no vaginal injuries. Uh, and uh, if no semen is found inside her, well, it may have been that the rapist uh, used a condom. So the answer here is E. An 18-year-old retarded woman with an IQ of 50 agrees to have sexual intercourse with the 18-year-old president of the high school senior class. Sexual intercourse between these two people is best described as A, consensual sex, B, statutory rape, C, sodomy, D, child abuse, or E, sexual abuse? Well, this is something we did not cover in the lecture, but uh, let's get to it quickly. Um, it, apparently, it's a uh, consensual sex because, I mean, she was not raped and, you know, she agreed to have sex. Uh, but it's actually a statutory rape because if she has an IQ of 50, that's considered mental retardation, if you remember from our lectures on uh, IQ. And statutory rape is not only consensual sex with minors, but also with mentally retarded people. So in this case, it would be considered B, statutory rape. Well, not extremely poor, but they're among the poorer communities in the United States. And it's also unfortunately true that uh, African-American communities are at higher risk of violence. So as I was telling you in a previous lecture, uh, we can complain about all racism and it's a very legitimate concern but it's nevertheless true that a black man is more at risk of being killed by another black man than by a white police cop um, and this may have to do with poverty I mean uh, when people are poor well they, they have less access to education they are under greater stress uh, they may not be able to cover all their material needs and all of that uh, increases the chances of uh, that the, the community may turn violent and the people may turn violent. Okay, having guns in a society also seems to have some relationship to aggression. Now, this is a very politicized topic in the United States, as I'm aware. Uh, the National Rifle Association will probably beg to differ on this one, what I'm saying. But I think the statistics are, are, are out there uh, that show that those countries that have uh, tougher gun controls uh, usually uh, have uh, better numbers when it comes to violence. Uh, I think this is common sense. I mean, if a government uh, tries to control weapons, then there, are, uh, the, the, there is not as great as an opportunity to kill other people. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, there aren't any other ways of uh, killing people, of course. I mean, if you take a look at the Rwandan genocide, uh, that uh, monstrosity was not carried out uh, with machine guns, but rather with machetes. And machetes are not outlawed in, in, in the United States or in any other country. And I think the people that uh, oppose gun control, they may also have some arguments uh, when they say that really those laws apply to the common citizens, but criminals will always find a way to have laws, to have guns. So. Uh, if criminals uh, sooner or later will have guns, then we might as well allow everybody to have guns in order for the common citizen to be uh, better defended against crime. And that may be an argument, but I think that overall, uh, and the argument, the, the evidence seems to point the other way, that the, the more a society controls weapons, uh, the, more, uh, the, the less violence there is. Another important factor uh, is inequality. So it's not so much poverty, uh, but uh, how unequal societies are. And it is, this is undeniably true that uh, those societies that are extremely unequal tend to have uh, more violence. So I can speak, for instance, for Latin America, 
Uh, Latin America may not be as poor as some African countries, uh, but it is hugely unequal. And in Latin America, the greater, the, the more unequal a country is, the, the higher the violence rates. And uh, there was a famous philosopher in the 19th century. His name was Karl Marx. You probably heard of him. And Marx, uh, amongst many other things, uh, he put forth this argument. And he was basically saying that, well, when societies are very unequal, there is a tendency to, for people to clash uh, amongst themselves. And, you know, there are many psychological reasons for this. There is envy, there is resentment, uh, there is a sense of injustice, and when people feel that they're... Hello, today we'll continue with our series of lectures on behavioral science. Uh, the topic we're going to cover today is aggression. It's very important to get to know this topic, uh, especially when we make a relationship or a connection with some of the disorders that we'll cover later on uh, that are uh, categorized in the DSM-5. Uh, we should uh, be especially concerned with the conduct disorder and the antisocial personality disorder that uh, um, one of those, one of the criteria for diagnosis has a lot to do with uh, one of the criterions for diagnosis for those disorders uh, have has a lot to do with aggression. So it's important for uh, physicians and for any student of uh, psychology to understand the basis of aggression. Why do people turn violent and what can be done about it? And uh, U.S. doctors in your rotations will sooner or later unfortunately will encounter cases of uh, victims of aggression so it is important for you to know how to proceed and what is the both the ethical and the legal and also the medical procedures uh, when you face uh, intense cases of aggression uh, with any of your patients so we'll also pay some attention to rape and what to do in those cases and why does rape happen um, remember that all of these topics will be covered in the USMLE, so at the end of this lecture we'll uh, do some uh, review questions uh, with the ones that resemble the ones that appear in the USMLE. Being, uh, that, they're not, uh, that society is not being fair to them, that they are not getting the piece of the pie that they deserve, they will usually uh, uh, get weapons and try to change things. Uh, via violence via violence so uh, inequality is another uh, important social cause of, of, of violence uh, broken families uh, yes of course uh, broken families are responsible for a lot of bad things in society and violence is one of them so I mean uh, you need par good parenting in order to educate children about uh, how to control violence how to uh, how to behave properly, how not to participate in aggression towards others. Uh, but of course, if uh, there are no parents around, or if uh, the parents don't care, don't pay attention to the children, or if uh, there are single parents and so on, then it's much more difficult to perform that education labor uh, in the home. And of course, uh, that lack of education uh, at the family level uh, increases the chances that uh, people will eventually become uh, uh, violent. However, despite all these social causes, it is nevertheless true, and this has uh, uh, upset some people, but it's nevertheless true that historically violence has decreased. And uh, a very famous psychologist, uh, a Harvard psychologist, Steven Pinker, has defended uh, this for many years. He argues that, uh, I mean, we may complain about all violence all we want, and sure, uh, there are the Columbine shootings and all of that, and 9-11, and uh, the war in Syria, and uh, the MLE exam. So let's begin. Well, when we talk about aggression, aggression is pretty much a synonym of violence. So it's uh, important for us to understand what are some of the causes of uh, aggression and violence. And we'll get shortly to the psychological and the biological causes of uh, violence, uh, which for you physicians is very important to know. Uh, but we should also consider the social causes of violence. Uh, I wouldn't say that there is one single cause of violence uh, or aggression. Uh, and there has been a lot of debate about what exactly causes aggression and violence. Uh, but we shouldn't leave aside the social causes. So it's probably a mix of many factors, both uh, psychological and sociological. And of course, the psychological is the biological. So within uh, 
psychological causes of aggression. There are also biological causes of aggression. But before we get to that, let's consider first the social causes. And first of all, uh, aggression is related to poverty. Uh, those countries, not necessarily the poorest countries, are the most violent. Uh, the United States is far from being one of the poorest countries in the world. In fact, it is one of the richest. Uh, but it is nevertheless true that it is uh, quite uh, violent, at least compared to other countries that are as prosperous as the United States. So, but having said that, we can still make a strong correlation between poverty and uh, aggression. And even in, in if, for instance, even inside the United States, those areas that are poorer tend to encounter uh, higher rates of aggression. So, for instance, African-American communities well, it's a very unfortunate fact that, yes, they are very poor, and it's also